And then I want to move on to testing for autoantibodies because I think this can be really tricky, um, not just for parents, but for doctors too. This is, it's really tricky stuff, how we test for these autoantibodies and, and what these tests mean. Uh, so the first test I want to talk about is called immunoprecipitation. And this is how we discover these autoantibodies in patients by taking uh, proteins from cells and then radio labeling them, or basically making them, this is all in a lab, not, not with patients around anymore, but we make those proteins radioactive. And then we take the sample from the patient that has the autoantibody and see if it binds anything. And so the autoantibody, if it's present, will bind to its specific protein. And then you can separate that out by adding beads into the mixture. And the beads will bind to the whole complex. They're very sticky, so bind to everything. And then you can run that down on a gel to see where these proteins go. Um, and that will kind of go down either by a charge, the electrical charge, or by the molecular weight of the protein. And then you can expose it to a film so that you can actually see where that radio labeled protein is. And if you know what you're looking for in terms of what charge or molecular weight, you can say, oh, okay, there it is. I have a line there. That autoantibody must be present. And so this is really considered the gold standard method for detecting many of these autoantibodies. And I just have an example of what this would look like for different autoantibodies um, based on their molecular weights and looking at these bands where these bands are popping up. The downsides to this technique is that it's very costly and insurance doesn't often pay for it. And it takes several months for the result to come back depending on where you send it. And it's available in very limited centers across the world. Um, really only one center will do it here in the US that you can send samples to. The next test that's commonly used is called a line blot or a line immunoassay. And this is where you have, um, you can see on the right side, I have these strips. So those are individual strips and one through five are individual patients. So this is, it looks just like a little piece of paper with tiny pieces of paper together put on one strip. And so if you look to the left-hand side and imagine that strip being turned on to its side and that bottom part is the membrane. And on each of these little pieces of paper is the protein or the antigen that the autoantibody will bind to. And so these are all loaded with row 52, OJ, EJ, PL12, PL7, they're all loaded up with each of these antigens all down the line. And then what you do is you add the patient's serum to it that presumably contains the autoantibody and the autoantibody will bind to whatever strip that autoantibody antigen combination is occurring in. And then you add secondary autoantibodies and stains so that you can detect what's going on. And so you can see here, patient one is positive for row 52 and SRP, those lines there. The positives of this is that it's very fast. It actually only takes about half a day to do. And you can test for all these different autoantibodies at once on a patient. The problems is that you can have false negatives. So maybe only part of an antigen or protein is loaded onto that membrane and not the whole thing. So if you're recognizing a different part of it, you might not get a positive result even if you have it. So that can be problematic. The third test is called an ELISA or EIA. This stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay or enzyme immunoassay. And this is very similar to the line blot test that I just described, except um, this uh, um, container that this person is holding here, each of those dots is for a different patient. So these are all occurring in a little cylinder inside of this uh, plate. And each of those dots is loaded with a different patient serum. And then the same test is occurring where you load um, the antigen onto all of those little dots or the protein onto all those little dots. And then you add the patient serum and the antibody is binding to it. And then again, you do a secondary and a stain so that you can see it. And the positives of this is that it's very fast again. You can test for many patients at once for um, one type of autoantibody. And you can even get a 
quantitative result out of this. So if you have a titer or level of how strong that stain is. The downsides is that you can often have false positives or false negatives, meaning that it says that you don't have the autoantibody, but you really do, or that you do have the autoantibody and you really don't. So there are many different centers across the U.S. that test for autoantibodies. Um, Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation um, does all of its testing by immunoprecipitation, which is, like I said, the gold standard. Um, but there are also other laboratories that do other types of testing. Uh, it's important that the doctor that's um, ordering these tests knows which autoantibodies are included in each test and knows the limitations of that test. So sometimes it's good um, if you get a result back and it says that you were uh, negative for any autoantibodies, well, you wanna look at what autoantibodies were really tested because sometimes they're only partial panels and not complete panels of all the autoantibodies. And that information is found on each one of these laboratory websites. It's not restricted at all. You can just go and Google each of these laboratories, see which different tests there are and what different panels there are, and then ask your doctor which one was sent to see if all the autoantibodies were sent or if it was just a partial panel. And then I wanted to address some specific questions that um, were raised so along the last week and a half or so. Um, one of them was, uh, do, do autoantibodies change over time? So the presence of a specific autoantibody usually doesn't change, but like I said, titers may go up and down with disease activity. So we usually don't retest for autoantibodies. Um, there are some instances where you can monitor titers over time, but this really isn't done clinically in the US. It's more for research studies um, because it's very costly and insurance probably wouldn't approve this. Um, but it is something that you can just know about that that can happen. Okay. We also have limited data if people develop new myositis associated autoantibodies over time. So this could happen. Um, people could over time as their disease progresses, they could be getting new autoantibodies. We really just don't know. We don't have the data to support that or to not support that. So we really have no recommendations on retesting for myositis associated autoantibodies. And the testing for autoantibodies is really only helpful in patients that were suspicious that they have myositis or they have a diagnosis of myositis. So not in unaffected siblings, because it is possible that there are healthy patients out there in the world that have these autoantibodies, but they don't have disease. So they really don't mean anything. There was one question about where can I go to find um, a handout to give my doctor. There's actually a lot of different articles summarizing autoantibodies. Um, and if you don't have access to them on the internet, uh, your doctor might have access to them and you can maybe request it um, through them or um, through even PureJM might have access to some of these articles. This one of them is a review article by Drs. Pakman and Koja, and it very nicely lists out all the different autoantibodies, um, what they're targeting, what, how common they are in juvenile myositis, and what their clinical associations are. There are other charts like this in many other review papers as well. And there's a lot of ongoing autoantibody research. So better characterizing autoantibodies uh, in the future, seeing really how, how do these associations um, really stand? Uh, is it really true that it's more severe disease or what about that heart involvement in patients with SRP? Is that really true or not? There's always ongoing characterizations of these autoantibodies in research. And then another really important part of research is identifying new autoantibodies. So about 30% of kids test negative for an autoantibody. And we don't know if that's because they don't have one or it's just that we haven't discovered it yet. Um, so we're trying to identify new autoantibodies all the time through different methods. And this is a really important part of research. And there's also research undergoing evaluating the standardization of autoantibody testing. So like I talked about, there's all these different methods and a lot of different labs are doing them. And we need to know what really the gold standard is and how to interpret these tests and how do they compare to each other. And a lot of people are researching this, comparing these tests. 
There's really no evidence right now that these autoantibodies are causing disease. So there's no efforts right now to destabilize or neutralize specific autoantibodies, but there's nothing to say that that's not somewhere that research could go in the future if we find evidence that these autoantibodies are causing disease. And there are therapies that target the B cells or the producers of autoantibodies that are effective in treating myositis. And um, in, in one trial that looked at this, they found that certain autoantibody groups might respond better to this treatment, but those were specifically autoantibody groups that also had high interference scores. And they responded well to this treatment of rituximab targeting B cells. So I think there's, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done looking at these things. But the most important thing that I think I could leave you with is the importance of testing for autoantibodies. It really helps clinicians kind of characterize patients and try to decide clinically how to manage their patients. So if I have a patient that has one autoantibody versus another, I might be more or less concerned by certain disease features and I might treat things a little differently if someone that has an MGA5 autoantibody comes in with a cough, I might be a little bit more worried than if it were a different autoantibody because I know those patients more often get interstitial lung disease. So it really helps clinicians characterize patients. Um, it helps manage their disease. Hopefully in the future, it will even help choose treatment options. And it might even be important in the future for clinical trials. Uh, so I think autoantibodies are very important and the research that's being done for them is very important as well.